good morning, everybody. I'm Caroline Spillan. I'm the Director General of Engineers Ireland, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. Um, uh, Valentine's Day, just FYI, for anybody who may have forgotten, <laughs> might want to buy something on the way home this evening. Uh, so um, the event is being webcast, so hello to everybody who's online as well. And just to remind you that it does count for CPD credit, so this will count for one CPD credit. Uh, I'd like to thank the division for asking me to open this talk this morning, a very timely talk, and um, I, I've heard Peter speak before, and uh, I think what we're going to hear this morning is going to be very uh, helpful to us in understanding the various challenges that lie ahead. Um, you know, it's, um, it's one of those things that divisions do really well, which is identify what the needs of the members within that division are and then develop talks and identify speakers that would respond to that need. So I'd like to thank the division very much for asking me uh, to open it this morning. And I suppose for those of you that might not be involved in the division or uh, very closely involved in the division, just a call out to say that, uh, you know, to get involved, there are always um, spaces on committees and also just even with regard to attending committee meetings, if you didn't want to take up a, a committee role, uh, it's always very good to, to attend and obviously it provides a great networking opportunity. So uh, thanks to, to Michael, the chair of the committee, and to Carl and to Orla and Eileen for all of the work that they've done in pulling this together. So uh, just one more thing before I, s I speak about the event this morning. Um, as all of you are here because you are inspired to become engineers, or most of you engineers, um, and we have Engineers Week coming up in early March. And it, this is just another request that as much as possible, if you could uh, link within your organizations uh, or link with the STEPS team here, steps.ie is the website, because we really need uh, as many people as possible to get involved in uh, sending that message out to young people that engineering is a great career. But young people need to see what engineering is all about because we hear it over and over again. I don't really know what engineers do. And you're the key to all of that. So if they can see what you're involved in by explaining the projects you're involved in, uh, then they're more likely to, to think about it. Just in this morning, I was listening to Morning Ireland. And they were talking about dropout at IoT level and um, uh, uh, Institute of Technology level for engineering courses can be quite high, not at university level. So there is an inspiration piece required there. So steps.ie, if anybody would like to get involved in Engineers Week, there'll be hundreds of events all across the country. But to today's event, uh, this breakfast briefing, um, I suppose, is all about the uh, the future. And, um, you know, looking back in the past, in 2000, the electricity industry took a new path as competition in the supply of electricity to large electricity customers arrived. Then five years later, a full market opening allowed all electricity customers, regardless of size, to choose their own supplier. So competition had fundamentally changed the structure of the industry in Ireland. And now, 20 years later, the industry is at a critical juncture. Uh, electricity generation is responsible for around 20% of Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions, but has the potential to reduce Ireland's emissions uh, by up to 60%. So a national debate is required in respect of meeting our climate targets. And this talk will consider how electricity can uh, contribute to this and how we can go from perhaps 20% of the problem to 60% of the solution. And it underlines the strategic importance of the electricity sector in solving that problem. And we're delighted to have Peter O'Shea here today. Peter was appointed uh, head of ESB Corporate and Regulatory Affairs in 2018. Before this, Peter was head of Regulatory Affairs and Corporate Strategy. He's also vice chairman of the Electricity Association of Ireland and a board member of the British Irish uh, Chamber of Commerce. Before he joined ESB, Peter spent 12 years working with CEGB and the National Grid Company in the UK in a range of technical roles, including NGC's program manager for the development of the NETA trading arrangements. So I'd like to invite Peter to address you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. And look, thank you guys for coming along this morning. Um, I hope you get something out of it. Just to pick up what Caroline said about engineering being a great career, it genuinely is. And just to put a plug in for electricity, electricity is a superb career. 
I started off in electricity back in 1987 uh, with the CGB in the UK. I hadn't planned a career in the electricity business, but that's the way it's worked out um, because the industry has gone through such change over the period that you can actually have five, six, seven different careers within the one sector. So uh, yes, a shout out for engineering, but equally a shout out for, for electricity. Um, this, the, elect the, the electricity sector has never been more important to social and economic well-being than it is right now. And I think in the period come ahead, coming ahead of us, it's going to become even more important. I suppose that's the trust of what I'm trying to get across this morning in looking at some strategic considerations around the energy sector. Now, look, you all know what ESB looks like. It hasn't always looked like that. And when I look to the future about what the sector is going to look like and how ESB should fit in that, I always start by looking back at the past. And when I go back to, you know, 19 years ago next Tuesday, the electricity market opened in Ireland. Now, for the younger people in the audience, it has always been like this. It has always been an open electricity system. But it wasn't always like that. Prior to the year 2000, ESB was everything in the sector. I remember when I came back from the UK first, my first conversation with Tom Reeves, who was the, the regulator in Ireland at the time, and Tom said to me, you know, Peter, the problem for ESB in this upcoming liberalized market is you're 100% of everything, and you can't be 100% of everything into the future. I think as a company, we grasped that, we realized that, and we worked to move our position so that we wouldn't be 100% of everything into the future. And now our market shares in generation and in supply on a bigger market across the, 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 the island of Ireland were just over 30% in supply and just under 40% in, in electricity generation. So it marks a massive change over a relatively short period in terms of the system um, that we've, we've moved significantly. And I think ESB is stronger for that. And I think the industry itself is stronger for that. But the scale of change we've had, I often use this slide just to think about a conversation that's, you know, if Bell met Edison now, what sort of conversation would they have about the sectors that they were both instrumental in finding? And I think Bell would say to Edison, you know, I don't recognize the telecom sector. We don't have a dial tone anymore. And in fact, we talk to your kids. Kids don't recognize what a dial tone is on a telephone. Such has been the change in the telecom sector. And I think Edison would say back to Bell, well, you know, yeah, the electricity system has changed over the last 20 years, but I still recognize it. Still big power stations, big wires, and consumers hit a switch and it all works. But I think Edison would then go on to say, there's a guy down the road, right? His name is a scientist from Carlo. John Tyndall, and at the same sort of time as Edison and Bell were talking about uh, telecoms and electricity, John Tyndall was exploring how climate change and the greenhouse gas effect uh, would operate. And I suppose fundamental, fundamentally, when we look forward, it's the discoveries of Tyndall around climate change and around greenhouse gases that is going to be the formative trend that's going to structure the industry um, and the sector in the years to come. So when we look at a strategy in ESB, um, and we went through a big strategy review in 2017, and I'll speak a bit more about that later. The four major trends that we identified within the sector. First of all, huge shifting regulatory priorities. We've seen a massive focus on competition over the last 20 years. I think the focus more recently, and certainly the focus into the future, is how we will deal with climate. Coupled with that, technology has moved on substantially in every part of the, of the supply chain, whether it is the generation business, the wires business, or supply and how you engage with customers. Technology has increased, has, has changed massively what we're doing. The way customers interface with the industry has changed significantly. To the extent that it's only a short number of years ago, we always called customers consumers. And just think of the language, consumer. Consumer is very different to a customer. With a customer, you have to actually think and worry about what that customer wants. With the consumer, they consume their product. And I think the, the, the essence of what is happening in the consumer markets right across Ireland, right across Europe, is that consumers are looking for more from their suppliers. And the same is happening with electricity. And we take those three trends together, we're seeing a significant change in the business models of people coming into the industry with no background in the industry, but also people within the industry looking to reshape themselves to deal with these new priorities. So they're the four things that would have shaped our thinking about strategy in ESB. But probably the number one of them is climate um, and the, the climate change agenda that we're all facing into. So back as, as, a, as a precursor to our strategy, ESB undertook a pretty significant review of, um, of climate, 
and how the electricity industry was going to deal with this. And we published a document uh, in November of 2017 called Ireland's Low Carbon Future, the dimensions of a solution. And the idea behind it wasn't to set out what the solution actually is, but to try and set out what are the dimensions that if we bring them all together can deliver um, the, sort of a, the sort of agenda and the sort of objectives that have been set for Ireland. So we looked at a whole range of roadmaps. Um, we did some of our own research around different technologies and a whole range of roadmaps from third parties. And our intent was to, to deliver a roadmap to deliver Ireland from where we are right now to where we need to be by 2050. And I suppose the starting point for any discussion on climate is not a discussion on renewables, it's not a discussion on CCS, it's not a discussion on EVs, it's a discussion on where do our emissions come from. Because unless as a country we understand where our emissions come from, well then we will not make the right decisions in actually addressing them. And in broad terms, Ireland produces 60 million tonnes of uh, greenhouse gas equivalent each year. And in broad terms, it breaks down a third of those come from the agriculture sector. Now, we don't have any energy solutions in the agriculture sector, so I'll park them. The other two thirds, in broad terms, a fifth comes from how we generate electricity, a little bit less than a fifth, 18%. A fifth comes from how we transport ourselves and our goods um, across the country. And a fifth comes from how we heat our homes and our businesses and how we use process heat in industry. So if we can think about what makes up our emissions, well then we've got a chance of thinking through properly around how we address the entirety of that donut of emissions. And the target that has been set at government level uh, that we have, that Ireland has, has, has set unilaterally is between 80 and 95% reduction in our total greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Now, I know if you're doing the maths on the second bullet point here, you'll say, well, 80 to 95% of 40 million tonnes in energy isn't quite 6 million tonnes. But that's because of how it's accounted for. It's, it's, the, it's the tonnage in 2005 that is the measure against 80 to 95%. And that results in us requiring to get from 40 million tonnes in the energy system, there's 60 million tonnes overall, including agriculture, to get from 40 million tonnes in the energy system down to less than 6 million tonnes by 2050. That's a massive challenge. And I suppose, coming back again, it's not about solutions just yet. It's about focusing on reductions. It is all about how you reduce the carbon and greenhouse gas emissions across the entire sector in Ireland. So our, our solution is, is quite simple. Electrification, we see, has been key to reducing greenhouse gas emissions not just in the electricity system, but also in transport and in heat. So if we can decarbonize the electricity system, and we're making great progress on it, and then use that decarbonized clean electricity supply to replace oil and gas in the transport system, um, and replace or reduce oil and gas in the heating system, then rather than electricity being 20% of the problem, electricity can become 60% of the solution. So that's why I say, that's why I said at the outset, Electricity has never been more important to society and economic well-being as it is right now. And into the future, electricity is going to become even more important to societal and economic well-being. So the rest of this presentation then just goes through the three dimensions and the technologies that we see as being really important to delivering on each of the three dimensions. The three dimensions, just remind ourselves again, decarbonize electricity generation, decarbonize transport by electrifying transport, and decarbonize heat by electrify electrifying heat. And in the heat system, one big call out. Between now and 2040, Ireland will build 500,000 new homes. Those 500,000 new homes, we have a choice. We can either build them based on electric heating or we can build them based on fossil heating. If we build them based on electric heating, they're future proofed for the agenda that we need to meet by 2030 and by 2050. If we build them based on fossil heating, we probably have to rip out the fossil fuel burners at some point in the next 10 or 15 years to get to the sort of targets that Ireland has already signed up to. And in terms of that target, that 80 to 95 percent target reduction in the energy system that Ireland has, has signed up to, the general science out there now is saying that's probably not enough. Certainly the lower end of the 80 percent is probably not enough because the general science is saying that the earth is still warming and that the, the level of reductions we need to deliver in carbon over the period is going to be even more severe than the levels that we're signed up to. So the rest of the presentation goes through each of these three areas and just uh, sets out some of, the, uh, some of the technologies we're using. 
So in terms of electricity, um, you know, there's been great progress made on electricity uh, from, you know, 1990, um, you know, almost a thousand grams of carbon produced for every kilowatt hour of electricity generated. Through to 2016, 2017, when it's down to around 500 grams. So the carbon intensity of electricity system has halved at the same time as electricity system in terms of total demand has doubled. So in one way you'd say, well, okay, the, the total carbon produced by the electricity system is the same, but you're getting twice the value for your buck in doing that. So the, electric, the intensity of, car of carbon and electricity has halved in the period now. And a big driver on that is wind and solar, and these are just experience curves from Bloomberg of wind and solar technologies. And you can see the trend is very, very clear. And that trend is expected to continue in terms of cost reductions on these fundamentally important tech technologies to delivering on the low carbon agenda in electricity. There's a similar slide later on around battery technology. Again, the, the, the trend is very, very clear. Energy density is going up and the cost per unit is going down. And one of the things I think we should be doing an awful lot more in Ireland, you know, we, we, do, we do suffer criticism in terms of our non-ETS emissions. By non-ETS, what I mean is the emissions in our heating system, the emissions in our agriculture system, and the emissions in our transport system. We suffer a lot of criticism for them because we're not meeting our targets. But the one thing we should be shouting from the rooftops on is the success we've had in integrating renewable energies onto, onto the transmission and distribution system. And in fair, a lot of credit for that goes to Airgrid in terms of their, the, the, the analysis they've done, their ability to actually integrate. We're actually, we're actually world leading in this space. And whilst this graph here shows a number of countries, it shows Denmark a bit ahead of us in terms of their penetration of wind. They're 40% plus, we're 30% plus. Um, it's not a linear graph. Um, the one thing I say about Denmark, and great, well done Denmark, but Denmark is synchronously connected to Germany and to Scandinavia. It's a much easier job to integrate renewable technologies onto an integrated grid synchronously than onto a grid like we have, where we have no synchronous connections with anyone. We've got two DC connections to, to Great Britain, but no synchronous connections. So to me, our 33% or 32% in 2018 is at least as good as the 40 odd percent in Denmark. And I think the ambition and the targets we're showing, like our, our SNSP level of 65% now is world leading. And I just think we should be shouting that from the rooftop. Electricity has done the heavy lifting to date in carbon reduction in Ireland. And what we need to do now is make sure that we use that clean electricity supply to do heavy lifting in the other sectors. So in some respects, by 2020, I, I fully expect that we'll meet the 40 cent target. I know um, it's a presentation last week by the department, by Kevin Brady, the department, saying that just less than 40 percent was where they expected to land. I think we'll meet, we'll meet the 40 cent target by 2020. Um, and I think we'll get to 50% by the mid-2020s. But that's based upon progressive improvement in the amount of intermittent generation you can have on the system at any one time. So right now, Airgrid have 65% uh, intermittent um, generation sources on the grid. So to get to an average of 40%, you need a high peak level that the grid can accommodate. In our view, to get up to the 50%, you've certainly got to get beyond the 65% presently. And the target is that by this time next year or the following year, that the SNSP will be up to 75%. But to get to levels significantly beyond that, require getting that SNSP up to not far from 100%, 90%, 95%. We don't see a pathway to that yet. But it certainly is the ambition that we should have. So in, in some respects, the first lap of decarbonization of the electricity system is well underway and actually has been achieved. The second lap is far more difficult because we can't just continue the first lap because of this SNSP problem. So we need to look at different solutions. And the solutions we looked at were uh, the four in there, you know, massive storage and further interconnection. And look, it, it'll be part of the solution, but in itself it will not be the solution. And when I explain just a couple of simple maths to you, I think you'll get, you'll get it straight away. If we're to store one day's worth of electricity, for when the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine, we would have to build 60 new Turlock Hills. That's just not achievable. It's not a credible number to build 60 new Turlock Hill power stations across Ireland. You wouldn't get the environmental clearance to do it. You wouldn't find the geological formations to do it. Or the alternative is we put 15 million Powerwall, Tesla Powerwall batteries, 10 kilowatt hour Powerwall batteries on the back of our homes. And again, it doesn't sound like a credible number to me, 
it's around six batteries, five to six batteries for every home in Ireland. And these are big, chunky things. So whilst I think interconnection and storage will be important parts of the future, particularly in managing the, the, the within the disturbances on the grid, I don't think they give you the opportunity to deal with the prospect of an anti-cyclone, which results in no wind and very little sun for a period of five or six days. So the second option you looked at was nuclear. And you know, in Ireland, nuclear, there is no appetite, and it's, it's actually doubly illegal. Um, there's two different acts uh, passed by Dáil Éireann which uh, make nuclear illegal. And equally, I don't think nuclear fits in our system. Nuclear comes in big blocks. They're building 3,000 megawatts on one site in, uh, in England right now, in Hinkley Point. That would not fit in the Irish system. In fact, to fit that in the Irish system, you'd have to build another 3,000 megawatts beside it, just to uh, provide backup. So I don't think nuclear is the answer. Biomass. Uh, biomass is renewable. I think biomass will be part of the future. Uh, but with any fuel with bio in front of it, uh, bio will be scarce. All the roadmaps show that the, the, the demand for biofuels will increase, but the ability to source them uh, will be limited. The positive of biomass is it provides you with a dis dispatchable generation that helps to address the synchronous problem with having a lot of intermittency on the grid system. So I think it's part of the future, but certainly is not the future in itself. And the fourth option is carbon capture and storage, where you continue to use gas, but you capture the, the carbon from the gas. Now we think that Ireland has a unique requirement for CCS, and we're very supportive of um, the Kinsale Field um, and GNI looking looking at that. Um, and part of the reason why we're really supportive of, of it is we don't see a fifth option. There are the four options we have to deliver on the second lap of electricity decarbonisation. And of the four, I think biomass is part, I think storage and interconnection is part, but I think we have a unique requirement for carbon capture and storage. So our view on electricity generation is there's no silver bullet out there. We need to keep all of our options open as technologies emerge and technologies improve and technology opens new doors to deal with the problem we have presently. So when we put all that together in terms of our roadmap for electricity generation, this is where this is where we landed. From a system that presently produces around 12 million tonnes of carbon, of greenhouse gas equivalent, to a system which produces less than 1.5 million tonnes. With a significant and growing proportion of renewables, probably largely wind, but some solar as well. That's the green block. Uh, with, with penetration of CCS, which is the red block, replacing existing uh, combined cycle gas, which is the blue block, and a small contribution from, from biomass um, and some other smaller, smaller, smaller sources like uh, waste to energy. If I move on then to transport, and um, this is a slide from Bloomberg, uh, which they used at the IIEA Take Charge conference that ESB ran in Dublin in 20, 2017. And like, there's been a question out there whether, you know, electrification of transport, whether EVs is the way. My, my answer to that is, I think, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not a question of when EV, of, of if EVs take over from the internal combustion engine. It's a question of when they take over. And when you, when you page to this slide, I think it illustrates the point. <coughs> because the decision hasn't been made by the policymakers in energy or in transport. This decision has been made by the automobile manufacturers. So what this slide tries to do on the x-axis and y-axis is it plots the different different types of model on the y-axis and it plots the, the range of different models on the x-axis. As you page through from 2008, 2009, 2010, it just shows the new models coming on the market all the way through to 2020. New models across many different uh, automobile manufacturers. That's where we are now and further additions due in 2020. It's not... It's not um, it's not an exhaustive list of all models, um, and it, the slide, as I said, is, is two years old, so I'm sure there is further additions to it. But I think it makes the message much clearer um, than any other slide that, that I have seen in terms of this decision has been made. We now need to get ourselves future-proofed for electrification of the small vehicle transport. Um, and the reason why is from this slide. So what this is showing you is the battery cost across a number of years and the energy intensity of the batteries across the same number of years. So the bar chart is the cost of batteries and you can see year on year monotonic reductions in battery cost. And at the same time the red line underneath it is showing you the energy intensity of the batteries. So when you put those two together you can see why the range anxiety questions, which were massive questions for the, for the EV industry to deal with back 
five or six years ago, you can see how they're being relieved because battery technology is advancing at a pace that allows us to build models now where 300 kilometers, 400 kilometers become the market entry level. And we put all that together in terms of our roadmap. Uh, we will move from around 12 million tons of carbon of greenhouse gas equivalent in 2015 to uh, less than 4 million tons by 2050 as electric vehicles progressively replace diesel and petrol cars and light commercial vehicles. We think in terms of larger vehicles, we're not discounting electricity solutions to larger vehicles. Uh, we think there's potential for biofuels um, for larger vehicles, but there's also potential for electrification. Um, there's a lot of work and a lot of research going on there. But the numbers we put up here broadly show um, EVs in the light, uh, in, in, in the small vehicle and the light vehicle class and biofuels in the, uh, in the larger class. Turning then to heat, um, I break heat up into three different areas. Um, I think firstly, we've got to think of the current installed base of heat in domestic premises in Ireland. And that's a big chunky problem, 1.6 million homes, uh, large majority of them either gas or oil. But to me, the starting point is you don't mop up your kitchen when you've got a leak until you've turned off the tap that's leaking. So the starting point is turn off that tap. And so the tap is the half million homes we're going to build over the next, next 20, 30 years. We've got to ensure that when we build them, that they're future-proofed. So they need to be built to a standard of fabric that are hugely energy, energy efficient. And then we have a choice. Do we include within the building design a fossil burner or electric heat pump? And to me, it's a no-brainer the answer to that. And thankfully, looking at some of the results right now in, um, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of current builds, around 40% of new houses built by developers in Ireland right now are actually using heat pump technology, which is really, really positive. We need to get up to the 80s, up to the 90s, to really make a dent into that 500,000 new homes we're going to build. And part of the reason I think why we're not up there just yet comes back to the old adage by... If you recall back when IBM and Apple were going head to head back in the 80s, IBM, IBM ran a brilliant campaign and the campaign said nobody ever got sacked for buying IBM. It was aimed wholly at Apple. Apple were seen as the, the West Coast, you know, the guys in California. IBM were seen the East Coast, real serious business people. So it put the frighteners on people buying <coughs> Apple computer, computers for business purposes and it worked the dream. I think it's the same issue here. We need to give comfort to developers that the electric heat pump will deliver the scale of heat and the comfort that, that customers require into the future. And one very interesting proof point for me was this time last year, which was actually the, the first and second of March, when the heavy snows in Ireland. And a number of people in ESB have actually invested in heat pump technology. And we use the Yammer system in ESB to sort of share photographs and share comments on how we're all getting along and work, right? There's a lot of smug people on Yammer that afternoon putting up photographs of their lovely warm homes uh, in the middle of the snow, the snow outside, lovely warm homes based on heat pump technology. And again, it's just an anecdote to show that you know, this is the technology that, that is coming. It's, it's a technology you put one unit of electricity in and you get three to four units of heat out. So in terms of carbon, one unit's worth of electricity, one, one unit's worth of low carbon electricity in and three units of zero carbon heat out. It's a no-brainer. The other two areas of, um, I mentioned there's three areas here. One is new homes. For the existing homes that we have, 1.6 million, that's a big ask, right? So you can't put a heat pump into an existing home and expect it to work without doing significant work on the fabric of the house. You actually need to insulate the home as well. And that can be an expensive problem. Well, that is an expensive process. But we took great comfort out of government's last plan for the NDP, uh, put aside 4 billion euros uh, to start the process of addressing the fabric of Ireland's homes. So that four billion investment is an investment out for the next four or five years. Uh, it's going to require a lot more than that over the period. But the great thing about this, you know, reinvigorating our homes is not only does it give you high energy efficiency, it gives you much more comfortable living in terms of if you're using heat pump technology, the air quality is better, um, and it gives a more comfortable uh, with, uh, living environment. So we think that between now and 2040, we have a lot of time to make sure we get a program in place that addresses the 1.6 million homes in a systematic manner. And remember, this is rural Ireland. 
where the vast majority of these homes will be addressed. So it gives a real prospect of an economic stimulus across all of rural Ireland. And in terms of the engineering that goes with it, there's a need to build up craft skills, technology skills, and engineering skills. So we have the ability to address that huge pipeline of homes that will need to be renovated and retrofitted to deliver the low carbon future that we need. The third area then is industrial heat, you know, high temperature heat for industrial processes. And yes, electricity has a part to play in that, but we'd see biofuels, uh, biogas, biomethane as a component there as well. So when we put together um, the heat and we put together transport and we put together electricity, um, decarbonized electricity system, electrified transport system, electrified heating system, gives us the prospect of turning 20% of a problem into 60% of the solution. And that's what's driven our asks of government in terms of the, the various consultations that have been underway over the last number of months. So to us, for 2030 and beyond on an electricity system, we need to regularize the regulatory and legislative arrangements around offshore wind. Ireland's made massive progress in terms of penetration of wind onshore over the last, uh, last number of years. Um, and sometimes there's criticism of our position offshore. I don't buy into that. I think the right thing to do was to do the onshore. Onshore was much cheaper uh, 10 years ago than offshore. Onshore technology is much better understood 10 years ago than offshore. But now as we're coming towards the latter end of the onshore uh, capability, we now need to look offshore. And in the period since, offshore costs have reduced substantially and offshore technologies have increased massively. So now is the time when Ireland needs to take the offshore resource and use that to deliver from the 40% we'll be at in 2020 up to the 50% by 2025 and beyond that to government's target of 55% by 2030. So we need a better legal and regulatory framework for offshore wind. And as I mentioned earlier, we believe Ireland has a unique requirement, unique across Europe for CCS. And I know there's a lot of criticism about CCS out there, and it's a, it's a big ask. The technical challenges are, are significant. Uh, there are lots of pilot plants in place, but perhaps not full commissioned roll, plants rolled out. But what we should do is, and Ireland can't lead that development, what we can certainly do is put together a working group from at government level with all the expertise around uh, the, the various companies in Ireland operating this space and work up what the problems are and see can we find answers to those problems. Because we do have a resource in the Kinsale field. We have a big reservoir that could be used for, the, for, for carbon storage. So I think there's a real need for us to move on that. In heating, we're saying we should now plan for the end of fossil fuels in new homes. And we're asking that a comprehensive working group be established to look at how do we address all the different components that make up the 1.6 million homes from the existing heat base. And in transport, we're saying maintain the good supports that are in place. You know, ESB eCars has done super work over the last 10 years, led the way for many years, um, and has just received a big grant from government to, to, to push on and reinvigorate our charging network across Ireland. So we need to make sure those supports are maintained so that it becomes an easy choice for somebody when they're purchasing a new car to decide to go electric rather than go fossil fuel. And we think that heavier transport, we need to keep our eye on the research and development of that space, particularly around rail freight and some of the mass transport um, options. So coming back then to where ESB is at and our, and our strategy. And you know, I, I started the talk by talking about 1999 when the electricity market opened first. Mary O'Rourke was the minister at the time. And at the time, I joined ESB in 1999, and at the time, ESB's mission in life, our purpose, was to keep the lights on at the lowest possible cost. With competition, that's changed. We no longer have any statutory obligation to keep the lights on at the lowest possible cost. We have obligations around how we build <coughs> networks, and delivery of electricity generation, and electricity supply are wholly for the markets to determine. So we struggled a little bit in the period to define what is our purpose in life. And in deciding to, re to, to, to refresh our strategy in 2017, we decided to start with what is that purpose? Because purpose-led organizations, all the, all the research data would indicate that purpose-led organizations uh, find their way through their business an awful lot better than, than, than organizations led solely by the pound, the shilling, the pence. So the purpose we set for ourselves, and it is ambitious, it is to create a brighter future for the customers and communities we serve, by leading the transition 
to reliable, affordable, low-carbon energy. And it's energy, not electricity. It's the energy sector, not the electricity sector. Because if we want to address climate change, you've got to think broader than electricity. And having done that strategy, we would have, or have, in, in terms of informing that strategy, we would have gone through the four big trends that we'd that I've previously outlined. And we settled, we, we asked ourselves, how, how will the system, how will the system operate in the future? And so if we look at the past, you know, the past has been about passive consumers. The present and increasingly into the future is about engaged and active consumers. I suppose by an engaged consumer, uh, it's people who are interested, but also it's bringing the technology to bear so you can be engaged without necessarily having to do lots of stuff on your iPhone or set your dials in your home. You know, there's a concept in the industry now of price to device. So how can we make the Internet of Things work in order to price to device and make all of how customers engage happen in a relatively automated manner rather than customers having to be engaged every minute of the day to decide if their electricity demand should be up or down. We're moving from discrete energy products to bundled energy and service products. We're moving from a position where IT provides a platform for the transactions we need to do the business to IT digital analytics providing the insights um, and the innovation to drive the business to new areas. We're looking from a position where for the last 90 years we've dispatched electricity generation to meet forecast demand. The system in the future will not be dispatching electricity generation to meet forecast demand. The system in the future will be dispatching what Eamon Ryan calls the dance. That's the dance between demand and generation. So as you have intermittent winds on and off on the system, and you've got uh, demands on and off in the system, the system has to dispatch the demand and the generation together. Dispatch the dance. We'll move from a small number of large power stations to a large number of small power stations. And crucially, we would see right now in Ireland and across a lot of Western Europe, electricity makes up just 20% of the energy we use. Crucially, we would see that increase in between 40 and 50% of the energy we use by electrifying heat and electrifying transport. And a very interesting report produced by Euroelectric uh, back end of last year, uh, supported by McKinsey's. And uh, the, re the report we did in November, this, this this one here, that would that would have been our significant input into it. Um, and that report, broadly speaking, is talking about an energy system where electricity takes a much bigger part of the overall energy demand, up to around 50%, and in some scenarios, even bigger. And I suppose the past has been about the island. The future is about how Ireland integrates with Great Britain and with, with, within the EU. And clearly, in the context of Brexit, there's questions about how we do all that. But that is certainly still the future that, that we see. So when we looked at the future um, and we looked at what objectives would be set for ESB and five strategic objectives, um, to the left hand side, putting customers current and future needs at heart of the organization. And like in some respects, that can sound like a trite objective. You'd expect most companies would talk that sort of talk. I think it's really important in electricity, really, really important. Because if you think of our business, we can foresee what's going to happen in generation reasonably well. We will see on the on the factory the factory lines how big the turbines will be in how big the wind turbines will be, say in five years' time or seven years' time. We can predict a lot of the engineering around it. Similarly in networks, we can predict what the transformation capacity required will be. So you can see the engineering horizon and you can see what's going to happen. But from a customer perspective, that's the software in the system. So the hardware will be on top of. But from a customer perspective, that's a software and system. Anyone who's looked after software as part of their career, I did for quite a while, if you change software, you get sometimes expected things to happen. And every now and again, you get things to happen you didn't expect. And so changing software, changing the customer piece, and customers are changing themselves, that's got the prospect of things happening that you do not foresee. And that's why we're saying that in terms of the organization and in terms of the sector, we actually need to walk in the shoes of our customers and understand in detail what customers require now and into the future. So we can anticipate where they're going to move to. Because there's some big things happening that will cause customers to ask very different questions of energy suppliers in the future than they've asked in the past. The second objective, producing, connecting, delivering clean, secure and affordable energy, that speaks to everything ESP has done for the last 90 years and everything we're doing for the next 90 years. But within that, just a couple of, a couple of headlines. You know, our, our plan, our, our, our internal plan in ESP is that by 2030, 
40% of our generation volume will be renewable. That's a really big step from where we are now. It means building 2,500, maybe more uh, uh, megawatts of wind and solar over that period. We built 600 in the last 12 years. We're going to build 2,500 next 12 years. That's a big ask. It means ensuring Ireland will need to build probably 4,500, 5,000 megawatts of wind in that period. It means ensuring ESB networks can do that for all generators and for all suppliers in the marketplace. It means investing in smart technologies within networks so the networks get much deeper understanding in the control room of what's happening on the LV network. And in fact, the next price control that ESB networks are developing uh, has technologies being considered that would give us that much deeper look down to the LV system. I've seen, I've seen some numbers saying we have 450 times the view of the LV system that we have presently. And again, that's a big, that's a big, a big challenging ask. But equally, as we put electric vehicles and we put electric heat onto the system, they're very different loads. So we have to build the copper where it's needed, build the transformation where it's needed, but we also have put in smart technologies so that we get a better use from the existing copper and the existing transformation cap capacity that's in the network. The third block of our strategy is around services. And you know we see the world moving from purely product to product and service. And I see that both at wholesale levels and at retail levels. So at retail levels, you know, our offering in the retail market is the climate, allows you direct control of how you use your heating system at home. That's going to become increasingly important in the, in the future. Not sure how easy it's going to be to monetize that. It could well just be a market entrant requirement. If you want to be in the electricity system, you've got to provide this sort of capability. But equally, when you look at the wholesale side of the market, generators right now divide juice to provide kilowatt hours, megawatt hours onto the system. With increasing levels of intermittency, they've got to have a bundle portfolio of services to go with that to enable the system operators to balance the system second by second across every day. So a huge focus on the services area of it. And on the right-hand side, you know, we're growing our business. Our geography is Ireland, Northern Ireland, and Great Britain. But we need to grow that business while maintaining a strict control on our financial strength. And finally, in a world where we're now competing with companies that we didn't know about two years ago, and companies who've been in this business as long as we have been, performance and innovation are going to be key to the future. So there are the five strategic objectives um, that we set for ESB. And in broad terms, that, that's, there, there's a whole bunch of targets underneath each of the five for, for the organization over the, next, over the next number of years. So some concluding comments. Um, I think the future innovation is hugely important. Climate change is going to define what we're doing. And I come back to what Steve Jobs said about climate change. It's a massive threat to us. But from an electricity perspective, it is a massive opportunity, and we have to see that opportunity and seize that opportunity. Secondly, and th the second comment always, al I've, I've, I've always liked this one, right? But it sort of rings a bell with electrification of transport. It rings a bell with EVs against the internal combustion engine. You know, Edison's electric light bulb did not come from the continuous improvement of candles. There is no level of continuous improvement of the internal combustion engine that will get the internal combustion engine to the level of carbon efficiency that EVs are at presently. Just think about that. Done some simple maths in ESB, right? And based upon the current mix of electricity on the system, with 30% renewables on the system, an electric vehicle is 30% more efficient carbon-wise per kilometer than the best of class um, internal combustion engine. So that's that 30% Renewable penetration increases to 40, to 50, 60, 70, to 100. The internal combustion engine can't keep up. So there's no level of continuous improvement in the internal combustion engine that will deliver this level of efficiency we, ha we, we, we will have now and will have in the future on EVs. And finally, uh, Dieter Helm, who I'd, I'd have high regard for in terms of um, an economist, uh, but an energy, energy economist. And he's written widely around the, the, the climate transformation that we need to do. And again, you know, we need to be technology optimists because we don't have all the answers right now. So we need to be open to those answers emerging. And while we produce this based on a low regrets and no regrets view of the future, based upon technologies we understood at the time 18 months ago, and we, I think this is a genuine blueprint for the future, Decarbonize electricity, 
use that decarbonized electricity supply to electrify heat and electrify transport as the overall the overall vector that we need to go on to address Ireland's problems. The details on read in terms of discrete technologies, be a technology optimist. And some of the technologies that we've suggested in this might change, some might not. But be a technology optimist, be open to change in technology that happens in the future. So thanks for listening to me. Um, happy to take any questions you might have. We just ask for anyone who does have a question, if you could raise your hand and wait for one of the roving mics so our webcast attendees can uh, follow along. Hello, I'm Margaret Dolan. I'm from Mortimer Moylan. I'm an electrical building services engineer. And I agree with everything that you've said there uh, to do with houses and apartments and whatever. But one of the frequently asked questions from the consumer or the customer, as you're now calling them, is what I can't see the benefit of my PV panels. I can't see it on my bill. I can't, yep. I don't get paid for it. Um, and so they're looking at they, when they're looking at the decision between PV panels and thermal PV, they can see how it heats their water. And I honestly think we need to look at that. Is that coming down the road? Um, well, there's actually a government working group, or there, there, there's a, a draft bill actually in the whole right now around microgeneration. Um, and when you look at the clean energy package, which has passed all the stages in Europe, part of that package requires that uh, supply companies pay for any microgenerated output onto the system. Uh, so that might be part of the answer. The big question is, how much do you pay? Because if you pay too much, well, then you're overvaluing it. You need to pay at the value that's the value the energy provides the system overall. So I think there's there's a fair amount of wind behind, if you, if you avoid, if, if you excuse the pun, behind micro generation right now. Um, of course, like I think you know, solar panels on the roof. Um, the two options builders generally have right now is put solar panels on the roof with a degree with, with a level of of um, of insulation or the alternative being to use a heat pump and you actually don't in order to meet the building regs you don't need the solar panels i would say that that, that is a better alternative right now in my view because it addresses the the carbon problem at source um but you know i suppose in terms of the question which is really about getting into into customers minds how do i see the value of what i'm doing um no doubt if you've got panels on your roof electricity bill will be lower Yes, but it's very hard for them to see. Um, with to do with the heat pumps, the issue that we seem to be coming up against is that um, it's not a widely used technology, and yeah. a lot of developers come back and say, show me where you've used it before. Yeah. They don't want to be the first guys. Yeah. We do think it's the way it's going, yeah. but that's one of the things. Now, NZEB is coming down it the is. road, yeah. and um, <clears throat> we haven't got that, hasn't been decided yet. The software is not available for us to work out how what is actually going to be yeah. needed. So we think you may need heat pumps and some some PV panels as Okay, well, I agree. Which, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's it's all coming down the road, and it's great, but um, I think if we could just, if the consumer can see yeah. the benefits, I yeah. think it'll make it move quicker. Yeah. Thank you. Think in terms of developers, yeah, and that's why I said, um, nobody ever, no, no one ever got sacked for buying IBM, you know. Um, but who won that battle in the end between IBM and Apple in terms of the PC? Well, I think Apple won it. So in my view, I think the heat pump will win out. But it does need to get a greater sense of understanding amongst developers. One fact, there, or one stat that I came across last week, I haven't actually verified it yet myself. Um, the stat I verified is that 40% of, de of developments now are using heat pump technology, right? Which is very positive. We need to get that much further up. But a stat I came across last week that isn't verified, right, is that on self-build houses, where people are making decisions themselves, not made by by a developer, by a builder. You know, if you've ever built your own home or done serious renovation, you know, you don't generally take people's view on it. As engineers, we go through all the maths and do it ourselves. Seventy percent, up to seventy percent of self-build homes, is what I'm hearing, um, are using heat pump technology. Now that that stat hasn't been verified; it's been said to me. Uh, but if that's the case, well, then I think the trajectory we're we're on is is pretty good. Uh, how you doing? My name is John Kenny. I'm an electrical engineer for Environment Consultants. Um, I've 
done a lot of designs and houses, etc. And we have put air source heat pumps into them. But the issue is apartment blocks. Yeah. A lot more of buildings are apartment apartment blocks rather than houses. How do you plan on sorting that out? Because there's not enough space yeah, yeah. normally on the side for yeah. the actual air source heat pump. But I'd hope in time that the, the size of the unit would reduce. So when you when you look when you go on the content view on the holidays, you see the air conditioning unit outside the apartment. Mm. Um, now heat pumps a little bit bigger than that. But if you get it down to the air conditioning size, well then you know now you're in the same sort of business as what you're seeing in the continent. Bank after bank of of air conditioning. Like an air conditioner is just a heat pump in, res- in reverse. It takes heat. An air conditioner takes heat from inside and dumps it outside. Heat pump takes takes heat from outside and dumps it inside using the same principles. Mm. So that's one part of it. Uh, but equally, you know, there's there's electric heat storage uh, units. You know, um, uh, the, the 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 quantum system by name's gone for me now, but the quantum system is one one big heat storage uh, system. Uh, again, utilizing low carbon electricity is still a better option than, than going down the fossil fuel route because you're building in future proofing. Okay, thank you. So basically, it's trying to keep it kicking, moving with Absolutely. the houses yeah. while they try and reduce the size yeah, of the yeah. pumps for apartment blocks. So. Yeah. And I think, look, if you look at, say, rural Ireland, for example, um, lots of one off houses. And heat pump technology is perfect there. And generally, the one-off houses have oil as the burn as the fuel. So again, you get a bigger bang for your book again if you replace oil with heat pump than if you're replacing gas with heat pump. Thank you. One more. Peter, uh, John Wallace, ESB. Uh, with the cost of uh, solar PV falling as much as offshore wind, where do you see the future energy mix for ESB uh, if, in terms of uh, solar? Um, solar is diff- it's a difficult, like the, the load factor of solar in Ireland is less than 10%, right? So I think solar is going to be less important to us than will be across much of the rest of Europe. Um, but like increasingly, you're seeing solar on solar, solar panels in new homes, um, and I think that that will increase. As for the large scale solar farms, you know they're competing with large scale wind. Um, some of the maths I've seen show solar costs even in Ireland going below below wind costs. Um, so like it will get a share of it, but like you know wind is in the preeminent position in Ireland right now. Wind wind is the vast majority of the 40 percent renewables we'll have by 2020, um, and I, I suspect that when the when the renewable energy support scheme runs out back end of this year, early next year, I think wind will be in the preeminent position for that as well. Um, but you know, there, I suppose that the one thing, and I, I was I was on a panel in Croke Park yesterday, and the minister spoke uh, prior to it or on Wednesday, Tuesday, and the minister the minister spoke prior to it, and what he said, which I fully agree with, is there's no one answer to this problem. There's a place for everybody. All technologies and actually helping deliver parts of this problem. And I think that's it, whether it's electricity generation or in the heat and the transport sectors. Um, the, the challenge is so big, you can't discount any, any of the pieces that make it up. So solar will have a part to play. I wouldn't, I wouldn't care to put a number on it, but I don't see it as being as big a part to play by, by a fair amount compared to wind, both onshore and offshore. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you for your talk, uh, Katrina Chardon from Ergrid. Um, you mentioned offshore wind as having a few barriers. What would you think would be the key barriers to remove to encourage the development of off- additional offshore wind in the Irish Sea? Off- yeah, the I'd say, like again, look, we we do a lot of looking across the Irish Sea to England and the UK, GB, and see how how have they uh, put in play. And look, like well, it's, it's been the gold standard of reg- regulation and of of electricity liberalization for the last 20 years. We should look beyond that as well to name in Europe and see how they're dealing with it. And like offshore wind has increased massively across across all of Europe in that period. But I think just looking at GB, you know, I think they've got their institution structures clear. Um, they've got their transmission structures clear in terms of how you connect. Um, and I'd say we're not, we're not in the same space here. Um, so like what I'd say in the first instance, it'd be great to see the math I bill uh, come from where it is right now to actually be enacted as, as an act by Dahl Earn. It'd be great to see the, the, the marine uh, spatial plan put out there. So then people actually have a better understanding of the what is the what is the, the starting point of the platform. But there's a lot more beyond that, you know, in, in your own area, we, we have got to consider how 
transmission is brought out to the IRC and how transmission is brought out to the Atlantic. What's the best way of managing that? GB has gone one way. Is that the right way for us? I don't know. We need to have those debates. I can hear you, John. You can hear me. Yeah. Right beside you. <laughs> Peter, um, just a question on the forecasting aspect, you know, and, and uh, let's say forecasting consistency, which I'm sure is all watertight. You know? But at, at the latter end, you were you were showing, you know, the 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 intention to move, say, from electricity being twenty percent of of energy supply. You know, demand that is met yeah, yeah. Uh, to maybe fifty percent. Yeah. Uh, so all else being equal, that that would suggest you know, um, in simple terms, like multiplied electricity demand by in terawatt hours by yeah. two and a half times, and then that just exacerbates the challenge of of uh, going to phase two of of uh, renewables. You know, meeting uh, decarbonization targets. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So we're at thirty, but forty percent of, of of energy demand being met now with renewables. Yeah. But we're at the limit of what we can do, or close to maybe, without going into you know the hard questions about the four options you had, like storage and interconnection, which will happen, I'm sure. Nuclear probably will stay stay out. Yeah. Biomass would be a partial solution, and I've forgotten off the top of my head the last one of four. CCS. But the carbon capture. Yeah. So which you were very keen on because yeah. you, you see that as a genuine solution. But uh, anyway, as I say, so, you know, we're, we're at the cusp almost of moving to where you have to make hard and tough decisions, not just technically, but economically. But that's as, as where we're meeting 20% of, of final demand. from. So if you, if you go to 50% of final yep. demand, and then you were showing carbon figures in millions of tons going from nine and a half, nine and a half in heat to one and a half. So that's yep. huge yep. Uh, displacement of carbon, like fossil fuels and so on, in heat and transport, like, with electricity. Yeah. So, what about the interaction? If yeah. you if you multiply but, electricity by two and a half times, have you resolved the problem? But unfortunately, I'd say it's a virtuous circle, right? Yeah. As an electricity company, it's a great circle. Um, like the big displacement is electricity replacing oil. I think that's the that's that's the big. I think gas will be used for electricity generation for as long as I'm around, right? Um, we would look to see CCS become a part of it, but even if it doesn't, any gas will still be required to provide that backbone. Um, so it, the real shift is electricity taken over from oil in transport and in heat, um, certainly heat in, in, in the initial uh, initial period. Um, we haven't even started to scratch the surface of offshore wind. You know, but like ESB announced um, a couple of weeks back, we're we're getting involved with the we're taking a share in the Oriel wind farm. Um, and there's the Arkle Bank down down uh, south of Dublin, but we haven't even scratched the surface. And like all of the, whenever you start reading on offshore winds, and the numbers are just staggering in terms of the, the capacity of the RSC and the capacity of the of the, 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 the Atlantic to provide to provide offshore wind. So that, that I think is the next big jump, right? And that's why I say, look to me, probably number one or two on the agenda should be the MAFA bill to provide the platform by which offshore winds can genuinely develop. Could I, could I add a writer about the, the, the heat question? Because, um, say, in the apartments, which is clearly a, a real issue, you know, you can't put like solar thermal yeah. or PV on each apartment roof, and the same with the heat pump problem. But in Norway, for example, because I, I remember a few years ago looking at, at, at um, electric heat, yeah. it's, it's still a very, very important issue. In, in Norway, where they, at that time, they were producing uh, 100 terawatt hours of, of energy, which is mostly hydro. Yeah. and renewable automatically and um their energy consumption per capita was huge electricity consumption yeah. was huge but their heating their home heating because their homes were, were uh, so well insulated their home heating was often direct electric heating not even storage yeah and it was literally five kilowatts was the home heating yeah. load five kilowatts per you know no i don't know how many square feet that was yeah i just just think about it like so again, direct heating yeah. as well as storage oh, absolutely, absolutely. In our, direct yeah. heating would work in ireland in yeah, a car it would absolutely yeah. and look at, i think if you ask yourself what, what, why does why why did norway go that path right well it's because it's got massive banks of hydro uh and hydro is zero short-run marginal cost electricity generation wind is zero short-run cost electricity generation solar is zero short-run cost electricity generation so as the electricity mix increases from 
moves from gas and oil and coal more and more towards these zero short-run marginal cost technologies, but it creates lots of issues we've got to solve, right? It does mean that electricity at the point of use, when you hit the switch, there's zero short-run marginal cost in using it. That's not the world we're in right now. That's the world that Norway was in 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and that's why you had a high penetration of, of direct heating. So again, to answer the question about apartments, that's, that's part of the reason why I would say direct heating and, and electric storage, uh, heat storage, would be um, part of the solution to that. Okay, just before we call the event to close, I'd just like to you know that the electrical division has a number of events coming up over the next few months, so keep an eye on your email and the Engineers of Ireland website for that. I'd like to thank you all for attending. Um, I'd like to thank our Director General, Karen Bland, for opening the event, and most importantly, I'd like to thank Peter for a very informative and interesting presentation, and I think we should all show our thanks to him.